But uh, let me pick up where I left off just before lunch. I was mapping out for you the basic order of service um, that was repeated twice every day, morning and evening, um, uh, at the tabernacle and then at the temple. Now, the descriptions that we have in great detail come from basically Exodus, to some extent from Leviticus, um, and they um, basically describe the service at the tabernacle. Here I've got a rough diagram of the tabernacle area, and I emphasise the rough part of it, um, but I want to, just to map for you the basic movement. Okay. Um, the service starts and ends here at the altar for burnt offering. Um, the priests on duty kill a male lamb somewhere up here and prepare the flour, incense and wine for the daily service. Prepare, do I say, and the lamb. So it's slaughtered up here. Uh, the blood is drained. Um, now, the actual service begins with the splashing of blood against the four sides of the altar here. Um, and then the rest of the blood is poured out at the base of the altar. Now, by means of that blood, God cleanses the priests who are on duty, but also the whole congregation. It's like our confession and absolution. If you wanted to have a rough mm -hmm. sense. Uh, there's some things that are different. You can't just put them on top of each other. Um, but uh, after that has happened, then the priest can approach God uh, safely without being afraid that he'll desecrate God's holiness and incur God's wrath. So the priest on duty, then um, the high priest or his deputy, next goes to the uh, basin here, the wash basin, and he washes his hands and his feet. Now, why would he wash his hands and his feet? His hands? Because he's going to handle, touch the holy things. Touch the holy things. Why his feet? He's going to walk on holy ground. Okay, um, there, and then he goes back to the altar here and gets a pan full of uh, live coals. Then bearing those live coals, he enters the holy place. Here, or somewhere here, um, the holy place. This is the main part of the service. There's other parts that are, are detailed, but this is what matters. Uh, he enters in the holy place and he picks up, as far as we know, the incense that was stored somewhere in here. And he puts it on another uh, basin or container. He comes here and stands before the curtain. Now, the curtain is not a single curtain, but it's a double curtain, uh, like that. The curtain that separates the Holy of Holies from the holy place. And he puts the coals here on the incense altar first, and then the incense on top of the altar. And as soon as that happens, the incense burns, uh, the smoke from the incense fills the whole space and it permeates his vestments. Uh, so uh, the way I used to say to the students, he goes in um, with B.O. and he comes out with I.O., incense odour. Um, and he himself then brings the sweet savour, the sweet smell of God's acceptance of his people, God's approval of his people, God's pleasure with his people. Um, uh, so that burning of incense is an act of intercession. He represents the whole nation, not just the congregation out here, but the whole nation he represents. And he stands in for them and he brings them into God's presence. The, the, there is the name of the 12 tribes of Israel he carries them on his heart 
and brings them with his vestments into God's presence. Uh, so he brings the people in, and then he brings, well, you can work out, what does he bring out from the Holy of Holies? I'll, I, you can answer that question shortly. Then he comes out of the holy place, uh, goes to the altar, and the altar at the tabernacle was fairly small. He didn't have to mount any steps. It was low enough for him to lay out the whole lamb on the altar. And he'd make sure that uh, there were coals all over the altar and the, the lamb would cover all the altar. The head here, feet forequarter here, the body here, hind quarter here. Do you get the basic picture? So the parts of the lamb would be laid out on the altar. And then he would uh, uh, stand to the side here and throw the incense uh, uh, mixed with flour on the altar. Now the people out here, here and here, couldn't see the fire on the altar. But then as soon as the incense, they could smell the fire because of the roasting smell from the lamb. But as soon as the incense was on the altar mixed with the flour, black smoke and the column of black smoke rising up to the sky. Now notice the fire and the smoke. The fire, God's glory, God's presence, but that was veiled in a cloud. Think of the glory cloud that led the people of Israel uh, from Egypt to Mount Sinai. The glory of God, which then filled the tabernacle when it was dedicated. Now, and the glory is revealed, manifested uh, in the rite of burnt offering. So the smoke rises up, column of smoke here, people out here, and then at the climax of the service, or the end of the service, he stands in front of the altar, together with all the other priests who are helping him. Um, there's an, also another feature, I'll come to that in a minute, and then he would stand there, face the congregation, and put the name of God, the most holy, holy name of God, on the congregation um, by performing the Aaronic benediction. Yahweh the Lord bless you and protect you. Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Notice the gracious there. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Uh, now, uh, as he's saying this, the people hear the name of God, but they can also, if they're close enough, can see the name of God, which is written on the forehead of the priest. There's there's a, a, a turban, and uh, then there's a metal plate on the turban, and on that turban is inscribed, Holiness to the Lord. Remember that? Okay. So he places the name there. And with that um, benediction, the main part of the service ends morning and evening. And there's only one thing that follows from this, uh, that the rest of the flower... Uh, for, of which a small handful had been burnt on the altar, is taken somewhere here, here or here, we don't know where, probably up here, um, where there's uh, fire and it's uh, turned into flat bread. No, something like pizza bread or something like that. Uh, and uh, that would be uh, provide uh, the Lord's rations for his servants every morning and evening. The morning bread, the evening bread. Now, uh, since the flour um, for that offering had been placed on the altar, the flour is most holy and the bread is most holy and that bread makes and keeps the priests holy. The bread of God, does that ring a bell? And, okay. Uh, so uh, in the uh, Old Testament, the priests would eat the bread, but they wouldn't drink the blood. Okay, and then uh, that would be the conclusion of uh, both morning and evening sacrifice. Between morning and evening sacrifice, the
the people would come and present their offerings. So the people's offerings were contained in, uh, 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 incorporated into the national congregational offering. Um, it's, a, it's a little a bit like, um, uh, you know, some uh, auxiliary service being offered after, you know, say matins or vespers, uh, offered apart from the divine service. But notice it's every morning, every evening. Okay, now I asked the question just before. The priest comes in representing, bringing the people and their names into God, God's presence. What is it that the priest brings out from the Holy of Holies? What does he bring from God to give to the people? Think this. He comes in bringing the people and their needs to God. He brings God's blessing uh, from the Holy of Holies to the people. And better than that, he brings God to the people. So uh, uh, the divine service is a meeting, the meeting of God with his people. Now, I always tell my students to look for the unexpected. Uh, if this was a pagan rite, where would be the place of meeting between God and his people? In, in here. And if this, a, if this was a pagan temple, what would be placed in the Holy of Holies? An idol. Now, the, uh, what, instead of the idol, what is placed in the Holy of Holies? The Ark of the Covenant with the cherubim. mercy seat, the cherubim. And that, that represents a throne, God's throne. Now, from a human point of view, if you could go there, you'd say, okay, God is enthroned there. Um, I would see God there. But it's an empty throne. God is invisibly enthroned on the cherubim. Uh, uh, there, it's an empty throne, um, th but that's the place of God's presence. But instead of God meeting with his people here, he meets it with his people where? There. Okay, and the understanding, and we'll come to this in a minute, um, is that God comes from heaven to earth to meet with his people on earth. Now that's the opposite to that Pentecostal teaching on worship, where we've got to go up to heaven to meet with God. Now there's a half truth in it. It's not completely wrong, but it's only because we can only do that because heaven comes down to earth. Therefore we can come into heaven. Uh, oh yes. Okay. Any, any questions on that? Do you get the basic picture? And always with this, um, uh, and with many things, the important thing is to, for you to see it, to get the picture of it. Get the picture and the other things fall into place. Yes? Where's the singing? We'll come to that. Now, but look, you, uh, you've, you're a good theologian. Where would you expect the singing to be? Now, this is the tabernacle, so there's no singing yet. A um, uh, few pages on, you get a picture of the um, uh, temple, but just guess where the singers are. Come on, Dan. In the court. Where in the court, yes. Would they be here? Would they be here? Okay. Which side of the altar? Congregational side. Here, here, or here? The third. <laughs> third, the one that way. Here. Okay. Uh, so it's closely connected with the place of blessing. It's closely connected with the altar and the offering. But the congregation is here and out here. 
and the, the, uh, the choir then, if there was a choir, it would be right here and they face the congregation. Right. Now, uh, one other thing, and this is important for this in, in connection with this, I haven't mentioned that as the burnt offering was placed on the altar, uh, here in the tabernacle, you had two priests, one priest standing here, another priest standing here, and they would face, partly face the altar and the congregation, and they'd blow the trumpets over the altar. And so uh, the singing of the choir was associated with the blessing of the priests and with the sounding of the trumpets. And this very significant place uh, between God and the people. God and the people. Any other questions? And the all, the, all the singers were men then. All the singers were men. They are Levites. They're part of the priesthood. Um, yes? And the singing was the Psalter. The singing was the Psalter, yes. The song book, the choir book was the Psalter. Uh, and it didn't come into existence all at once. We'll, we'll find about the origin of the Psalter. But the, the, the song that was sung, uh, uh, or the songs that were sung, were the Psalms. And the Psalms were not just sung then, but they were also sung um, uh, for the people and, and who presented their offerings during the two services. Um, yeah. Just to say, if you can imagine you know, having a, a private confession and absolution, after a service or you had a blessing of uh, a couple or a family or uh, other things like that or ministry to a couple and family that occurs between the two services any other yes when uh, luke records that sorry a bit loud when uh, luke records that zechariah went into the temple to is that this he was officiating Yes, he was, it may have been the only time in his life where he drew the straw and he was uh, officiating, representing the high priest and uh, 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 something awful happened. Uh, because it's, uh, uh, as you know, uh, the angel appeared to him, where? Where? In not in the holy place at the incense altar where he was to burn the incense so he burnt the incense um, there and uh, he took a long while that the people were wondering whether something bad had happened to him but he comes out and he's a priest who can't do what he can't give the blessing okay it's cut and that's very significant in Luke's gospel He's a priest who enters the temple and does everything right, but he can't give the blessing. And that's very significant. Now, that's the beginning of Luke's gospel. Do you know how Luke's gospel ends? We were in the temple continuously praising God. Yeah, but before then, that's the last verse. While he was uh, what? While he was blessed. Okay, Jesus takes them to the mountain. And as he was blessing them, uh, as he uh, was taken from their side, he blessed them. Here you have a new priest who blesses his people, uh, who doesn't bless his people from an earthly temple, an earthly sanctuary, but who blesses the new people of God from heaven. And so Luke is indicating here, and if you look closely, um, that it's not just that Jesus blesses his people at that moment, but then the, as the risen Lord, as the great high priest, and that's one of Luke's emphasis, is that Jesus is our great high priest. He blesses us from where? Heaven. From heaven to earth. And um, uh, he, we can't see him invisibly. He blesses us from heaven. So what was interrupted at the beginning of Luke's gospel then is fulfilled in a new way at the end of Luke's gospel. Isn't that cool? Yes. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yes. Love it. Any other questions? Right, and now what's going on? What is God doing for his people um, 
in that morning and evening sacrifice. Um, there's a lot of things going on, and you can read Bob's book uh, to uh, fill in all the details and the full significance of it. But I want to focus on the main, the big picture. Okay, the simplest explanation is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 24. You remember the people of Israel come to Mount Sinai, and at Mount Sinai, God meets with his people. Um, uh, the glory of God <coughs> is, the, is fire on top of the altar. A cloud covers the altar. Notice the fire, the glory, and then hidden in a cloud. And God doesn't reveal himself to the people at the bottom of the temple, which, rep which represents the courtyard where the altar is. Uh, he doesn't reveal himself by saying, da-da, here I am, look at me. How does God show himself to his people? Exodus 20, he says, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the house of slavery, uh, out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then what does he speak to them? The Ten Commandments. So these are the only words that God speaks directly to his people everywhere in the Old Testament. Elsewhere, he always speaks through prophets and to individuals. But here, the whole congregation is addressed. And you get the paradox that God doesn't show himself visibly to the eyes, although there is a visual aspect, the glory cloud there, but he reveals himself by speaking. He speaks his name and he speaks his law to his people, the Ten Commandments. Now, um, the, this experience was so terrifying for the people of Israel that they said, uh, this is just enough. Um, uh, why don't you, Moses, stand in for us with God and represent us and be our mediator and you receive the words of God for us and whatever uh, God tells you, uh, you tell to us and whatever God tells us, we will do. And so Moses then becomes the mediator between God and his people. Now, uh, uh, to get the sense of this, you need to re realise that the, uh, the temple is, I mean, the mountain is the first temple, as it were. Um, the tabernacle takes over from the mountain and becomes a kind of mobile Mount Sinai. Just as in the tabernacle, you have three main divisions. You have the holy, holy of Holies, you have the holy place, and then you have the courtyard. Now, the Mount Sinai, the holy of Holies, there is the top of the mountain where God is. Uh, where the fire is, uh, the uh, uh, body of the mountain, which is covered by a cloud and is to be fenced off so that uh, people and animals don't enter the holy place and desecrate it and uh, uh, suffer God's wrath, uh, uh, that represents the holy place. And then the bottom of the mountain um, is the courtyard here, and that's the place where Moses is told to build an altar on which he offers the first set of sacrifices and sprinkles the people with blood to make them holy and to consecrate them as God's holy people. Now, um, uh, the people say, you go and do this. And then uh, you have a little uh, segment that stands out because it's just by itself and uh, uh, it's easy to overlook the significance of this. Can you turn to Exodus 20? Um, I've written the main part of that down, but uh, can you just look at, at and see the lead into this? Exodus 20, um, the beginning there of this little incident. This is verse 22. 21, the people stood far off where Moses, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. You'd expect if Moses gets nearer to God, he would become more and more into the light. 
But here he enters the darkness, the thick darkness where God was. Then, Moses, then God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves how I have talked with you from heaven. God talking from heaven to his people on earth. Um, what did he give them? He gave them his name. He committed himself to them. He said, I am your God. I'm committed to you, dedicated to you. And then he gave them the Ten Commandments. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourself gods of gold, idols. But what shall you make? What takes the place of the idol here now? An altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxygen. Oxygen. Oxen. Ox oxygen too. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come and bless you. So the altar replaces the mountain. But it's a, not a mountain that you climb in order to get up to heaven, but it's a mini mountain, if you like, where God comes down to earth to speak to his people. And God says, uh, 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 that's the place where you shall offer sacrifices to me. Now, what happens when the people bring their offerings, their sacrifices to God? God says, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered, there I will come and bless you. Now, if this was a pagan story, God would say, in every place where I appear to you, you shall place my idol and build a sanctuary for me. And wherever my idol is, that's where I will come to you and bless you. God's name replaces the idol. And the altar then is the place where God comes, speaks to his people and blesses them. Um, God says, wherever I cause my name to be remembered. You can't build an idol anywhere, but only where God appears to. Um, the Israelites couldn't build an idol anywhere, but only where God appeared to them and said, I am the Lord. Where God comes and he gives his name, he introduces by name. That's the place where they can build an altar, and that's the place where they can call on the name of the Lord address the Lord by name, and that's the place where the priests will use the name of God to bless the people. So quite simply, what's the function of the daily public burnt offering? Tell me, what's God doing? He's interacting, he's coming. So the Advent are coming in order to bless his people. Um, remember this here, culminating in the priest standing in front of the altar and giving the ironic benediction. I will come to you and bless you. Now, um, the Lord's song is going to be connected with that. God's coming to his people and God blessing his people. Now, um, this is fleshed out in greater detail in the next passage that I want to look at. Exodus chapter 29. Um, God has instituted the uh, tabernacle with all its furnishings. He's instituted the priesthood. He's instituted the altar. And then you, he institutes the daily service. And just as I read this, look how dense this is and how much is compressed in it. This is the theology of worship in the Old Testament. And basically, the New Testament theology of worship is not much difference to this. God says, it, um, uh, that's the daily sacrifice, shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. So the service is to be conducted here. 
not in here, not in here, but the entrance to the tent of meeting is this area here. That's the main part. So the service is conducted throughout their generations in this entrance. The tent of meeting is this tabernacle. So it's the entrance to the tent of meeting. That's the place where they are to conduct the daily service. Um, um, before the Lord, where I will meet with you singular. You singular, God speaking here to Moses, and then later on to the person who takes over from Moses, which is the high priest. So God meets first and foremost with the high priest, Moses, and the priest on duty. So he meets with the priest who burns incense here. So he meets with the priest on duty, but that's only preliminary to another meeting. So God meeting with the priest. And he goes on to say, where I will meet with you singular um, to speak to you there. This is the place where God reveals himself to Moses after um, the tabernacle has been built. And that's the place where he also speaks to Aaron. And there's a number of words that God, uh, oracles that God gives to Aaron the high priest uh, to speak with you. There I will meet with the people of Israel. That's at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Uh, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will meet with the people of Israel, and it is a little bit difficult to pin down. Um, what's the it? It could be the altar, but uh, the gender is wrong. Um, the it could be the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, but mention of that is made not later. So the most, most likely it refers back to the people of Israel. So where the people of Israel will be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also in his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell with them. Now, what does God do in the divine service? Number one, God comes to his people to meet with them and to speak to them. Uh, he speaks to the high priest on duty, but he speaks to his people and the, he speaks to them by the benediction. So God speaks his blessing to his people. Um, they come to meet with God. Uh, so what's worship? In the Old Testament, but also New Testament, where God meets with the congregation. And the initiative, I can't go into the Hebrew here, but the verbs indicate that it's not a kind of meeting. You know, you are, uh, uh, you know, God and the people uh, decide, okay, let's work out where we meet. God arranges to meet with them, and they meet where God uh, says that they can meet with him. So just think of every service that we had. We went to chapel this morning. There God came to us in order to meet with us personally. And not just individually, but to meet with the whole community, the whole congregation. And God was meeting not only with the Israelites who were there, but also with all the Israelites who couldn't be there. So God's meeting... Um, God, the Holy God's meeting with his uh, sinful people. So he meets with his people. Um, he meets with the people, and the people are sanctified by his glory. Uh, unpack that. What does sanctify mean? Made holy. Made holy. So he shares his holiness with them. So how holy are the people? Perfectly holy as God's holy. God says, you will be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. Promise. Uh, it's also a fact. You are holy because I am holy and I've made you holy. 
So God meets with his people to make and keep them holy. Um, and why does this have to occur over and over again? Sin. What? Sin, right? Sin comes in. That's one. So they need to be cleansed again and they need to be made holy again. And there's another deeper reason than that. It's the blood of animals. Yes, that's the means by which he makes them holy. But you can't put... It's a bit like the light of the sun. Can you possess the light of the sun? What can you only do? Just ask, receive it. Yeah, bask in it and receive it. Unless you stand in the light of the sun and the presence of the sun, you don't have it. Uh, uh, you don't possess God's holiness. You only have it as long as you stand in, in its presence and receive it. So uh, God shares his holiness with his people. Uh, amazing. Uh, he makes them holy. He keeps them holy. He continues to uh, give, share, uh, convey his holiness um, to his people. So if the people want to be holy, uh, just as if I want to be uh, uh, in the light, I need to stand outside in the sunlight. So if the Israelites want to be holy, they need to stand in God's presence. Now, notice there the reference, uh, they will be sanctified by my glory. This is a word that we're going to come back to again and again this week. What does it mean that they are sanctified by God's glory? Yes, Dan? His presence. His presence. Yeah. Um, the light of his presence, the radiance of his presence. So his presence makes them holy. It's not uh, the tabernacle itself. It's not the sacrifices in themselves. Uh, but God's presence uses this. Uh, uh, God uses these things to reveal his presence to his people. And his presence and his glorious presence uh, is, makes and keeps them holy. Next. Uh, where am I? Uh, they will be sanctified by my glory. Notice it's God's doing. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. So the people are made holy and the tent is made holy and the altar is made holy. And also the priest. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate or make holy to serve me as priests. Okay, there should be a full stop here, which I uh, failed to put there. Uh, so uh, uh, what does God do? Let's say the first thing God comes to meet with his people. Number two, God speaks with his people. Number three, God makes his people holy. He consecrates, he sanctifies them. What's the next thing? I will dwell, no, yes, I will dwell among the people of Israel. So what does God do? Through the tabernacle, the daily service, God dwells with and in the midst of his people. This is a bit funny because where is God's residence? Where is the place that he dwells? In heaven. But by means of the tabernacle and the daily service, God dwells in the most unlikely place of all. Notice the emphasis is not so much dwelling in the temple, but dwelling where? There I will dwell where? Among, in the midst of the people of Israel. Next, even more surprising. And this turns things back to front. In particular, normal, normal Protestant theology, God says, I will be their God. He doesn't say, um, uh, I will dwell among the people of Israel and they will be my people. Uh, the implication would be then they therefore need to commit themselves to me. They need to obey me, but they need to commit themselves uh, to me. He turns that around. He says, I will dwell among the people and I will be I will commit myself to be their God. I will uh, uh, 
make myself their God and I will serve them as their God. Notice how things are turned around. Um, God puts himself at the disposal of his people. He commits himself to his people. Next. And they will know that I am their God. Um, not they will know that, I, that they are my people, but they will know that I am their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. So what was the purpose of God calling Abraham, rescuing the people from Egypt and bringing them uh, to Mount Sinai so that he could dwell in their midst? Could I turn that over into the New Testament. What was the purpose of God's creation of us? What is the purpose of all God's dealing in the Old Testament? What's the purpose of the incarnation of his son? What's the purpose of the ministry, life, death, resurrection of Jesus? So that God can dwell with us. Emmanuel. God with us. God dwelling with us as his people. Um, that they may know that I am their God, committed to them, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them, with them. I think I've covered all bases there. Any, any questions on that? Isn't that wonderful? Uh, okay. And this is Old Testament. Uh, uh, the New Testament's even better than that, but uh, you only you'll only understand lots of the New Testament if you have this background. I mean, say for example, you can read uh, Matthew's Gospel. It begins with the fact that Jesus' name is not just Jesus, Saviour, but that he is Emmanuel. This is uh, just broad Ma Matthew's theology. Then the next reference is that uh, in Matthew is in chapter 18, where Jesus says, where two or three gather together in my name, notice the name again, there I will, hmm? I will be in the midst of them. Notice the in the midst here, I will be in the midst of them. And then at the very end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, that what's the last words of Jesus to his disciples? Lo, I am with you always to the end of the world. Picking up this theme from the Old Testament. God with us. Uh, and even the ascension of Jesus, uh, the, the ascension of Jesus doesn't mean that Jesus is absent from us, but it means that he is more present with us, closer to us, than he ever was before. Uh, a great theme that runs through both Testaments. Now, one final uh, story. And it's the story from Leviticus chapter 9. Um, Leviticus 9 is, describes the inauguration of the divine service, the first performance ever in human history of the divine service. It's not at the temple, but it's at the tabernacle. And you have a description of an elaborate ceremony um, uh, uh, of sacrifices. And uh, uh, the story is just very briefly uh, this, that when um, Moses and Aaron had presented all the sacrifices, um, they, uh, uh, there's a whole range of sacrifices then. They came out of the tabernacle and stood in front of the altar and blessed the people. And the moment they blessed the people, the glory of God appeared to the people. Fire came out from the Holy of Holies and lit up the altar. And a cloud of smoke ascended from the altar and the people bowed down, prostrated themselves before the altar, and uh, acclaimed God. Notice here two things that go together. 
uh, blessing the people and the appearance of God's glory to the people. So right at the beginning, uh, God tells Moses uh, this. This is the thing. Um, he's referring to the whole ceremony, the enactment of the uh, divine service for the first time. So the divine service uh, is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do. For what purpose? So that the glory of the Lord may appear to you, may be shown to you. It's a theophany, a manifestation of God's glory. Uh, notice here two things. First, you have the correlation of the manifestation, the theophany, with the benediction uh, and its performance. So a, a God's appearance and benediction. Uh, most people, uh, if I advertised out there in Fort Wayne, God's going to appear here on, uh, out on the lawn um, uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Do you think everybody would come here? You know, if, if, if that was the case, people would be flocking into our churches. Why is that people stay away from church? And from God's presence. Fear God. Hmm? They literally fear God. They fear God. You know, they say, the roof would fall in on me. They have guilty conscience, yeah. and they know that if they come with a guilty conscience and God's presence, then they will come under God's judgment, his wrath. Uh, uh, but here, God's glory, the emphasis is that this is a safe appearance of God's glory. God appearing not as judge to, ju to damn and condemn his people, but he appears as saviour to bless his people. So appearance in grace. And secondly, notice that uh, God's um, uh, glory is veiled. God conceals himself in a cloud. He conceals the fire. And you know, normally what you expect is fire is not just light, but it burns. And God's holiness is a fire. And so he shows his, the fire of his holiness to us in a veiled form. He veils it in a cloud um, so that he can show it to us in a safe form. And that doesn't just occur in the Old Testament, but it occurs in the New Testament. What's the veil? that conceals God's glory in the New Testament. What's the cloud? Um, God comes, uh, uh, New Testament God comes to us as close as he possibly can, this side of heaven, and he, do, he, he hides himself, he conceals himself in what? Bread and wine. What? That's further on, but even before then, what? Jesus' human body. Jesus' human body. You got John. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, remember uh, 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 John's gospel? The word became flesh. And tabernacle, notice that language? Tabernacled among us. And we have seen what? His glory. His glory. The glory is of the only begotten Son of the Father. So we've seen his glory, but what's the only thing we've seen? A human being with a human body. Who would have expected that? He hides himself to uh, come to us and to reveal himself as fully as he can this side of heaven. And he continues to do that, and you've touched on that, with human words and human acts. Water, bread and wine, they are the cloud that hide his presence and bring him safely to us. Um, yes. Now, um, lastly, because God is present with his people, uh, his people and he is safely present and he is present in grace and mercy, what can God's people do? They can come to him in 
prayer. And they can ask for anything that they need. Look at that list of things that I put up there before. Uh, if they are in trouble, they can come to God for help. If they have experienced injustice, they can ask God for justice. If they uh, need anything, they can ask God to supply their needs. If they are having, uh, uh, if they are worried and observed, uh, uh, been hurt, they can ask God for compassion. Um, just whatever they, if they have sinned, they can ask God for forgiveness. Whatever they need, they can come to God in prayer. Um, so the temple is two things. It's a place of sacrifice, but it's also a place of prayer. Let's have a look at uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 11 to 16. And could somebody read that for me to spare my voice a little bit? 2 Chronicles 7, 11 to 16. And as this is read, uh, just listen closely, closely and look for something that's unexpected or surprising here. 2 Chronicles 7, 11 to 16. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. Is there anything there that surprises you? Yes? Is there anything there that surprises you? Yes. Uh, the Lord appeared to him at night. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's 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 quite regular elsewhere in the Old Testament. Not no. Uh, Testament. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, just just watch out. <laughs> no. In terms of what happens then at the temple and with the services, on the one hand, it's a place of sacrifice, but it's also a place of prayer. It's a two-way bridge. It's the bridge by which God comes to his people and it's the bridge by which they come to God in prayer. So the accent here in, um, uh, in God's uh, um, message to Solomon is that it is a place of prayer. Solomon dedicates the temple with a great prayer uh, and the temple then is the house of prayer. It's a place of prayer. Uh, and why is it the place of prayer? And you get a very strange kind of expression. God puts his name there instead of the idol. And by putting his name there, what else is there? Yeah, that's not what's said there. It doesn't say his presence is there. His eyes and his heart. His presence. No, get just stake with that quite concretely. Uh, his eyes, so that what? Sees our suffering. He sees our suffering. He sees our need. He doesn't interact with us, you know, the God who looks down from afar and sort of uh, uh, objectively, objectively analyzes us and deals with us from a distance. No, he sees us and he sees our need. He sees our suffering. He sees our pain. He sees us. And better than that, his, not only his eyes are there, his ears are there uh, so that he hears our voice. We have access to God's eyes, we have access to God's ears, and better than that, we have access to the heart of God. Just think, the heart of God. Um, uh, not just uh, externally to God, but we have access to God's eyes, ears, 
and heart. Uh, now, that in a limited way in the temple, in the New Testament, how do we have access to God's eyes and ears, eyes so that God sees us? How do we have access to God's ears so that he hears us? How do we have access to God's heart so that we uh, receive his love? Compassion. It's in the divine service. Yes, and what is, who gives us access to that? Jesus. Jesus. It's, it's in the sacrament. It's in the sac yes, and it's in the sacrament. Uh, uh, you come to the sacrament so that you, uh, God will see you. You come to the sacrament so that God will hear you. And as you receive the body and blood of Jesus, you have access to the heart of God. Uh, you get as close to him as you possibly can this side of heaven. Um, notice it's not just external, but it's ac access to uh, God himself and his heart and everything that's implied in that. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Right, that's the theology of worship and um, the basic order of service. Now, we'll have a break in a minute, but if I can just uh, uh, give you advance uh, sort of a preview. Now, the, the uh, performance of praise occurs within this context and presupposes this theology. So it presupposes... Uh, uh, this, this double action, uh, that the priest comes uh, it, uh, into God's presence and brings God's blessing out to his people. It presupposes that. Uh, and it presupposes that the altar is the meeting point between heaven and earth. It presupposes that the people come from the camp from their lives and they meet with God here. It presupposes that the people of God come uh, to receive, to, not just to meet with God, but to receive God's word and to receive God's blessing. It presupposes all that. And it's placed in there. And um, uh, you can, then there's a number of things that follow then. So the place then for praise is here in front of the altar. And the performance of praise is uh, between the altar where God is and where the people are. The performance of praise is connected with blessing and it's connected with the trumpets that were sounded of the high priest, of, of the two priests uh, uh, during the daily burnt offering. And all that is presupposed and it is locked in there. And it, it, it's, it's the way it works, its significance, everything uh, derives from that. Its location within that context, within the divine service, at the temple, in the service, every morning, every evening. That's where the psalms were sung. That's where the psalms were meant to be sung. That's where the psalms come from. Yeah, if I can just touch one final thing, because I haven't done it yet. Um, uh, the, the priests with their trumpets. Now, the normal, sig the normal instrument for signaling in the ancient world and in Israel was a ram's horn. Um, now, you didn't have radio, television um, to rally people, uh, but if you wanted to rally people, you'd get a herald blowing a ram's horn very, very loudly, um, and it just makes a lot of noise. But uh, uh, let's say uh, King Trump came to visit uh, Fort Wayne. Okay, no radio, no television, no newspapers. Um, the first inkling you'd get on it, you'd hear uh, some heralds, people coming down the main road from Washington, wherever it is, and you'd hear the sound of silver trumpets, long silver trumpets they would announce the coming of the king. They're royal instruments. And um, uh, uh, you'd say, okay, the king's coming. We either better run away because he's coming to create trouble for us, or he's coming, okay, let's go and see what we can get from him, um, uh, how we can petition him. 
and you'd hear the trumpets and you could follow where he's going by the sounding of trumpets. And what's the main uh, park here in Fort Wayne? Yeah, okay, wherever it is. Let's say Trump you... Trump, no, 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 he came... Uh, you heard the trumpet and you... you, you he, that it came out there um, here at the seminary and in, in, in at that uh, grassed area there in front of the seminary. Okay, and people all around would know that this is where Trump was. So trumpets are royal instruments. They announce the presence of the king and they tell people where to go to meet with the king. Royal instruments. You got the basic picture? We'll come back to the trumpets in quite a number of different places, but I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, uh, and so uh, I think of, okay, the king's here announcing the presence of the king. That's the Lord's song is connected with that because the function of the Lord's song is to say the king's here and he's available for you to come and meet with him and petition him. And the king's come here not in order to exact taxes or to punish you, uh, uh, to create trouble for you, but he's come to empty the treasury in uh, um, the federal treasury uh, here in Fort Wayne. 